Have you ever wondered how far some scientists will go to push the boundaries of medical science? Throughout history, faced with slow, costly, or ethically complex research processes, a daring few have turned to self-experimentation, unlocking groundbreaking discoveries but at the cost of personal risk and ethical dilemmas. But that is just the tip of the iceberg. As we dive deeper, things start to get pretty weird. But what is it that drives a person to use their own body as a laboratory? Let's find out. First up is the bathroom scale scientist. Santorio Santorio, born in 1561 to a mother that had clearly run out of names for her children, was around in a time in history when even the basics of biology were poorly understood. Friends with Galileo, he longed to bring the scientific method to medicine. Santorio was fascinated by the study of metabolism and the body's constant perspiration, called insensible perspiration. To quantify how much water the body was losing in a day, for a period of 30 years, Santorio used a now famous weighing chair of his own design to weigh himself, everything that went into his body, and everything that left it. When he compared the weight of what he had eaten to that of his waste products, he found that the latter was significantly smaller, and that for every 8 pounds of food that he ate, only 3 pounds of waste emerged. Santoria recorded thousands of these measurements, meticulously noting the effects of different foods, drinks, sleeping, fasting, and disease states on his body weight. Throughout this rigorous and systematic approach, he concluded that a significant amount of matter leaves the human body through channels not previously accounted for by medicine. His measurements suggested that roughly half a pound of water per day was leaving the body through either the skin or breath. This was the elusive to measure insensible perspiration. This work, although primitive in the grand scheme of things, was groundbreaking and his methods introduced the concept of quantification into medicine, a significant departure from the predominantly qualitative and observational practices of the time. An incredibly important step in bringing science into medicine, even if Santorio's relentless pursuit has doomed us all to a lifetime of side-eyeing the bathroom scale. Now, Santorio's endeavours were ultimately pretty tame. Let's venture deeper down the iceberg, back to science during the Age of Enlightenment, though we'll quickly see the approach here was anything but enlightened. Let's take a look at the man behind the laugh. Born in 1778, Humphrey Davy, a pioneering English chemist, joined the Pneumatic Institute in Bristol at the beginning of his career. The Institute's aim was to explore medical applications of artificially produced gases. The method of experimentation was reasonably primitive at the time. One of the very first tests of any gas was simply to breathe it in and then write down what happened. After breathing in carbon monoxide, Davy experienced headaches, dizziness, severe nausea, and reported feeling like he was sinking into annihilation. On being removed into the open air, Davy said in an understated way that only the English can pull off, I do not think I shall die now. In his respiration though of nitric oxide, which may have combined with air in his mouth to form nitric acid, he experienced severe chemical burns to the mucous membrane in his mouth. But undeterred, he also tried nitrous oxide, which is where he struck gold. Breathing in 15 litres of it for nearly seven minutes, he said, it was absolutely intoxicating to me. During a painful toothache, he noted the pain diminished after the first four or five breaths, and he was struck with a sense of euphoria and began referring to nitrous oxide as laughing gas. Despite his groundbreaking work, Davy did not immediately pursue the implications of nitrous oxide for surgical anesthesia. It actually wasn't until several decades later that nitrous oxide was used for that purpose. Instead, laughing gas became immensely and instantly popular with the British upper class for recreational uses, who described it as feeling like the sound of a harp. Eventually though, dentists and surgeons began to pay attention to its possible application for pain relief. Mixed with oxygen as entonox, it is still in use today as anesthesia. Risky, but ultimately pretty useful self-experimentation. But if ingesting an unknown substance is inherently worrying to you, consciously consuming something known to be harmful all in the name of science takes that danger to an entirely new level. Next up is the man who swallowed the evidence. 
In 1981, Dr. Barry Marshall was taking a training course in Perth, Australia, when he met Dr. Robin Warren, a researcher investigating gastritis, a painful inflammation of the stomach often accompanied by stomach ulcers. Earlier, in 1979, Warren had observed small, curved bacteria in the lower part of the stomach in several biopsy samples of patients with gastritis prompting the pair to begin research to determine the link between gastritis and the bacteria, called Helicobacter pylori. Believing H. pylori may actually be the cause of gastritis, Marshall and Warren published their results, but the idea that bacteria could survive in the stomach acid was considered laughable at the time, so the scientific community dismissed their paper as nonsense. And instead, the prevailing theory at the time remained that stress and excess stomach acid were the cause of gastritis. To prove their hypothesis, in 1984, Marshall decided to ingest a culture of H. pylori, almost immediately developing severe gastritis and doubling over providing the evidence necessary that H. pylori could indeed cause inflammation and ulcer formation associated with gastritis. Marshall and Warren then also devised the first H. pylori eradication protocol, using antibiotics and bismuth salt to successfully treat Marshall's infection. For their discovery of the bacterium Heliobacter pylori and its role in gastritis and peptic ulcer disease, Warren and Marshall were awarded the Nobel Prize in Physiology for Medicine in 2005. So worth it? I'll let you be the judge. Our next level entrant, though, also puts themselves directly in harm's way. The man of a thousand stings. Don't think I'm not noticing that these are all men. There's a reason women live longer. Researching insect evolution, Justin Schmidt was presented with a dilemma. He theorized that the more social a species of insects was, the more appealing it became as a target for predators, because the insects would ultimately be clustered together in large numbers, representing an easy meal. Schmidt theorized in order to survive, the insects would need greater defensive capabilities such as more painful stings. I think you can see where this one is going. To prove his idea, Schmidt needed to develop a scale that categorizes the relative pain of stings from numerous insect species. This became the Schmidt Pain Index, a four-point scale ranging from one least painful to four most painful, which as you guessed from his appearance on this list, he calculated based on first-hand experience with over 150 insects insect stings. Some notable entrants include, at level 1, mild, the sweat bee, with a sting Schmidt described as light, ephemeral, almost fruity, a tiny spark has singed a single hair on your arm. Quite poetic. At level 2, moderate, the yellow jacket, hot and smoky, almost irreverent. Imagine W.C. Fields extinguishing a cigar on your tongue. That last part was added after one fell into his drink and stung him on the tongue. At level 3, strong, the paper wasp. Caustic and burning, distinctly bitter aftertaste, like spilling a beaker of hydrochloric acid on a paper cut. And then there's level four, the tarantula hawk. Blinding, fierce, shockingly electric, like a running hairdryer has been dropped into your bubble bath. And another one of the most extreme, the bullet ant. Pure, intense, brilliant pain, like walking over flaming charcoal with a three-inch nail embedded in your heel. For his trouble, Schmidt achieved the highest honors possible for a scientist, an Ig Nobel Prize, and being the inspiration for viral YouTube videos everywhere. Let's go a little bit deeper, and a word of warning, this one is gross. The world's worst chef. Anemia is where your body doesn't have enough healthy red blood cells, limiting its ability to transport oxygen. In 1897, William Castle, a Harvard graduate, was exploring the disorder with a series of observations on patients whose anemia appeared to be nutrient-related. A disease called pernicious anemia, a then fatal morbidity characterized by the failure of the body to absorb vitamin B12 from the gastrointestinal tract. Castle's interest in the disease led him to theorize about the existence of an intrinsic factor produced in the stomach that was necessary for the absorption of vitamin B12. In order to test his hypothesis, Castle conducted a series of self-experiments in a rather unconventional and groundbreaking and gross manner. In one notable experiment, he swallowed a piece of raw beef after fasting, and after some time he retrieved this beef from his stomach using a stomach tube. He then fed the extracted beef to patients with pernicious anemia, as if their lives weren't bad enough. I told you this one was kind of gross. 
What he observed though was a steady improvement in his test subject's condition, demonstrating the necessity of combining the intrinsic factor with B12 for successful adoption. To confirm his result, he gave other subjects just beef and others just stomach juice. Neither group showed any improvements and both were disappointed. Castle's intrinsic factor is now recognized as an important contributing factor in the disease. But as you can imagine, his treatment didn't catch on. Nowadays, patients are just given massive doses of B12, so at least some of it is absorbed into the body. Now, it is time to go down the iceberg of self-experimentation insanity to the next level. The next set of scientists are ones that risked their lives, at times recklessly and at times heroically. Let's start with the human crash test dummy. After three degrees, two years of teaching, and two years of military experience, John Stapp, an American Air Force officer, flight surgeon, physician, and biophysicist, took a post as a project officer researching how to avoid getting decompression sickness in unpressurized aircraft. By exposing himself to various conditions, Stapp discovered that 30 minutes of breathing pure oxygen before a flight would be enough to avoid the formation of bubbles in his blood following rapid decompression, otherwise known as the bends. This bubble formation Formation can otherwise be fatal for high altitude flight as well as deep sea divers. However, Stapp is most famous for his self experimentation during the 1940s and 50s on the G Wiz, a rocket sled at Murrock Air Force Base in California. These experiments were designed to study the effects of extreme acceleration and deceleration on the human body. The primary goal was to understand how much G force humans could withstand without game over levels of damage, in order to ultimately design safer ejection seats and aircraft, especially as military jets at that time were reaching higher and higher speeds. Stapp's experiments were both groundbreaking and obviously very dangerous. He subjected himself to extreme conditions, willingly experiencing acceleration up to 46.2 times the force of gravity on November 10th of 1954. During a test where he reached a speed of 632 miles per hour or 1,000 kilometers an hour, he came to a stop in just 1.4 seconds. Stapp earned the title of the fastest man on earth, but these tests subjected him to forces so severe that they resulted in broken bones and concussion. The immense deceleration forces also caused a rapid increase in intraocular pressure, the pressure within the eyeball, which in turn led to temporary blindness. And at this point, it might look like he was just an adrenaline junkie seeking glory through risk, but his constant campaigning to research into safety to save lives looked to be his real motivation. Stapp's work had a profound impact on military aviation, influencing the design of safer vehicles and restraint systems, including seatbelts, in the automotive industry. Stapp's repeated bravery and lack of care for his physical well-being rockets him deep down our iceberg but he was surrounded by trained professionals with rigorous safety protocols. Our next contender laughed in the face of safety protocols, running his entire experiment alone, surrounded by snakes. Meet the world's most venomous man. Tim Freed is a factory worker with a strange side passion, highly risky self-experimentation. Freed's journey began with the realization of the significant gap in the availability and efficacy of antivenoms across different regions and snake species. Traditional antivenoms are specific to the venoms of a particular species and can be expensive and difficult to produce, limiting their accessibility in areas where they are often needed most. Freed was fascinated by the concept of self-immunization, which is where the body builds up a tolerance to venom through controlled and increasing doses of it over time. His early attempts at immunity, however, were definitely mixed. Following self-administering diluted venom over the course of a year, a deliberate cobra bite to test his immunity led to four days in a coma. Most people at that point I think would have quit, but undeterred, Freed decided to study immunology and refine his injection schedule, which ultimately led him, after some time, to this point. Well, very good reasons not to do this. Two bites, nice. I yes, that's a black mamba, one of the world's most venomous snakes, biting Freed. And here's another. Ah, got me twice, three times. Shoot. Right in the finger. I'll do one more in the arm. Tell me when you're ready. Make it fast. Two more bites. Following his early work on self-immunization, Freed branched out to working with Jacob Glanville to study whether a universal antivenom could be possible. As there are numerous venomous snakes, each with many different proteins in their venom, maintaining antivenom stocks is a real problem. Immune systems produce antibodies needed to neutralize a venom. Typically, these are made by injecting horses or sheep with small amounts of venom and then harvesting the antibodies produced. Freed hopes to produce a general-purpose antivenom 
through his own experimentation and multiple bites and venom building up in his system over time from many different species. It's definitely interesting, it's also definitely insane, but is it actually useful and is it working? At the moment, not quite yet, but he says he will continue until something comes of his work, and hopefully that something doesn't earn him a position further down our list. Our final notable entrants at the bottom of the iceberg are those that self-experimented around and found out, but yes, with noble motivations. Let's start with the Arroyo experiment. In the late 19th century, Arroyo fever was a significant health problem in certain regions of Peru but was poorly understood. Some believed it was two separate diseases afflicting the population. One, an acute illness characterized by fever and anemia, and a second disease that involved benign skin eruptions or warts. But a rising theory was that these were just two phases of the very same disease. In 1885, in an attempt to understand the disease better and demonstrate the potential connection between its acute and chronic phases, Daniel Carrion, a Peruvian medical student, inoculated himself with material from a lesion from one of the patients affected by the second stage of the disease. Several weeks after inoculation, Carrion began to develop symptoms of the acute phase, the first phase, including fever, anemia, and general malaise, confirming his hypothesis that both phases originate from the same disease. Unfortunately here, the symptoms of that illness were so intense that Carrion succumbed to the disease on October 5th of 1885, at the age of just 28. His experiment, though, provided critical insight into Arroyo fever, a two-phased illness eventually identified to be caused by the bacterium Bartonella bacilliformis, transmitted by sandflies in the area. His work significantly expedited understanding of the disease, which scientists reclassified as Carrion's disease in remembrance of his sacrifice. In a similar theme, our penultimate case is the mosquito martyr. In 1900, Jesse Lazier was part of the US Army Yellow Fever Commission, also known as the Reed Commission, which was sent to Cuba to study yellow fever disease. At the time, the understanding of yellow fever was that it spread through contaminated services that had been in contact with patients. However, a Cuban scientist, Carlos Findlay, had previously proposed that mosquitoes might be the transmission vector. So, to prove one way or the other, Lazier began cultivating mosquito larvae, allowing mosquitoes to feed on patients of afflicted by yellow fever and conducting experiments on volunteers, usually soldiers, to study the disease's transmission. Although the precise circumstances of his infection are a matter of historical debate, whether it was truly deliberate self-experimentation or accidental exposure, without permission or knowledge from other scientists, Lazier became infected with the disease. As his symptoms worsened, he wrote a letter to his wife saying, I rather think I am on the track of the real germ. The experiment proved the theory, but it also ultimately cost him his life, just 17 days after writing the letter. Although tragic, Lazier's work and the findings of the Reed Commission proved that yellow fever is transmitted by mosquitoes, leading to development of effective control measures that dramatically reduce the incidence of the disease, including destroying mosquito breeding sites and protecting individuals from mosquito bites, essentially ending yellow fever cases in the Panama region and saving thousands of lives. And finally, we have made it to the bottom, and I warn you this one is wild. I've even redacted and softened a lot of the worst tidbits about this one because this is a family channel. I bring you the human worm. Schistosomiasis is an acute and chronic parasitic disease caused by blood flukes, a parasitic worm of the genus Schistosoma. It's common for Schistosoma parasites to break through the skin of persons bathing, swimming, or fishing in contaminated fresh waters, predominantly in Africa. The symptoms of schistosomiasis include a rash or itchy skin that is followed by a fever, cough and chills, potential damage to the bladder, kidney, liver, spleen and intestines, and ultimately a very high chance of mortality. In 1944, Claude Barlow, a research scientist, was concerned that US troops returning from foreign deployment might bring the parasite back with them to the USA. Determined to study the parasite, he began by posting some snails infected with the parasite back to his lab. But the snail mail approach kept killing the snails and the parasites they contained before they could arrive. So Barlow decided to take matters into his own hands, despite knowing that the disease can be fatal. He decided the only way to ensure the parasite's arrival was to transport the worms inside himself. He put 224 schistosome larvae on his arm over a period of 21 days to let them burrow into his body. 
However, during his return trip to the lab, Barlow started experiencing symptoms of schistosomiasis, including nausea, blood in his urine, and difficulty breathing. The symptoms became worse, and most distressingly, he became feverish and began to find he was producing large quantities of schistosome eggs in his bodily fluids. His scrotum also began to swell and exude a serum, and his bladder became so damaged and inflamed that he needed to go to the bathroom every 20 minutes. Realizing how dangerous his situation was, though not after depositing some of his specimens in the lab, he immediately flew to Egypt for emergency treatment using a new experimental therapy. The new therapy left him with permanent heart damage, but the infection slowly began to subside. His report on the experience begins with the comedically dry statement, there is no previous report on a voluntary human infection with schistosome parasites. Despite making himself into the most unpleasant parasite postal system possible, the specimens he left failed to be sufficient for experimentation, so ultimately his ordeal was for nothing. Take your egg-filled bodily juices to the bottom of our iceberg, sir. I feel like I want to take a thousand showers now. It is clear that the spirit of self-experimentation driven by curiosity, bravery, and profound commitment to human health has been a pivotal, though highly controversial, force in pushing the boundaries of medical science. Please don't try any of these things that we've talked about at home, but if you like this video, feel free to experiment with pushing that like button. How far down the iceberg would you have gone? Let me know in the comments down below. Personally, I'm still working on my distrust of the bathroom scales. Though I gave myself snake bites repeatedly for 30 days, sounds like a great piece of content. As always, thanks very much for watching. I'll see you next week. Goodbye.